it's extremely important to realize that you do have a weaker limb or weaker muscle group. Yes, you want to target that as best you can. If you have activity in the muscle itself, you can still target that. You can still stress it enough to increase strength. However, don't neglect your strongest components. Work on those strongest components as well. So you can also get, if you cannot move a certain limb, you, you probably have your second limb that's functioning a bit better, and you can work that limb and still get some neurological carryover. It's kind of an overflow that even if the other side's not moving, there is going to be some carryover to the effect, uh, more affected side, weakest side. Second part is, if you are in a mobilized um, uh, device, a wheelchair, and you are sitting and doing your exercises, and also at home, you want to make sure that you're trying to be as unsupported as possible because you are supported in your sitting. And this um, goes towards the targeting of the core muscles. So if you, I like multi, multitasking and working on multiple things with one activity and one exercise, is that if you're going to work your arms, sit at more on the edge of the chair or at least come away from the backrest a bit more because throughout the day you're sitting and you're supported. That is significant deconditioning of the core. And if you just come away and move your arms and you do that routinely throughout the day, you're going to work your core muscles without even knowing it because you're working on balance as well as the core. So that's, that's two things I have to go forward. Okay, so let's go into the topic of um, gait and balance. I'm going to focus much more on the gait and balance as I said previously. So how bad can it be? I'm going to just pull forward you know, some evidence about just how prominent and how prevalent the problem of gait and balance is in persons with MS. Um, what are the main causes and what can I do about it? So here we have walking limitations. Upwards of 85% of individuals with MS have been found to have some type of gait uh, limitation. Increased energy cost. I think we've heard that a few times this morning. And that is definitely the case when we have gait and mobility problems. We are expending more energy to get from point A to point B with the in insufficiency of our ambulation or capacity of moving in that, in that uh, space. And then falls. This is becoming an ever more concern, obviously, with the current um, healthcare system that we are tracking falls as a primary um, uh, unfortunate outcome and, and an outcome to try to target to decrease the amount of falls that are occurring in our persons with MS. And that can be upwards of 60, greater than 60 percent. And of that 60 percent within this study from 2009, 70% of those 60% have multiple falls. So this isn't just one occurrence. However, almost three quarters of those individuals have multiple falls, and that is the concern. Obviously, uh, concern for uh, uh, the energy expenditure as well as injuries that can occur. So um, one general cause is the increased amount of disability. This is just a general scale of the ability to walk at a certain speed, so meters per second. That's been a marker for the ability to, number one, uh, walk effectively and efficiently. So that's something that routinely you're probably getting assessed in the clinic for baseline as well as follow-up visits to see how fast can you walk. The reason why is because then we can track your improvements or your uh, plateauing or worsening in that component. Um, so here we have an increased disability level in the pinkish, and the blue is the medium, moderate level of uh, disability, and then the green, and then we have uh, persons without MS as the controls. So you can see, even with the controls, um, there was a dip in the distance and the speed went down, but it was fairly level. As we go up in the amount of disability level, we definitely start off slower, even at the first few feet, and then continue to progress lower. And then our speed travels down as our progression of the disability level within the MS population progresses in disability as well as distance over time. So obviously the disability level overall can be a main contributing factor, but that's not the only. So the overall component of weakness is definitely a component. Your motor ability to propel yourself over time when you're walking, to get up and go, as we say, 
is definitely limited by weakness in multiple limbs as well as your trunk. Cognitive, an ability to dual task, and this is something that I focus on quite a bit, and this will come into the overall balance and coordination aspect that I subspecialize in. And the dual tasking is really being able to chew gum and, and walk at the same time, be able to think. If you're having difficulties with your balance and or ambulation, you kind of go hand in hand sometimes, most often. And so if you're having to, to, to concentrate on your ability to maintain safety, safety is number one, um, as you realize, it's hard to think about anything else. So that, in my eyes, becomes quite fatiguing mentally, as well as a disruption in the safety and ability to stay upright. So that multitasking, and, and it doesn't always have to be uh, limited due to cognition or you know, memory, but even those that have really, really well intact cognition, multitasking and ambulation can be difficult. Uh, coordination, this is this test that we, we do every time you come in the clinic. You know, is there any tremor, is there any ability, uh, ability to really get that accurate point, as well as in the low extremities, um, that can definitely be a limiting factor in being able to be safe and being able to ambulate over <laughs> Upright posture control. This is going to be something that we emphasize in, the, in half of this talk uh, this morning. Limb sensation, the ability to feel uh, primarily your legs and being able to feel what the ground is telling you and where your leg is in space is obviously a concern if it's limited. Uh, vision, if you do not have a visual uh, field, that you can really take in, uh, that's hard for you to uh, be mobile. And then dizziness and vertigo, and then spasticity. So the areas of our talk will be in these areas of upright posture control, balance, and limb sensations, uh, vision, uh, and dizziness as a component that is something that I strive to really target in many of my patients. And then also a, a brief talk now on spasticity and the point that I take in the clinic as well as my clients. So this is a, a study that Dr. Corboy, uh, myself, and other colleagues on campus uh, undertook a few years ago and finally published it last year. And it was a study to see if what's called vestibular rehab. Now the, the overall arcing theme here is that individuals, human individuals, any individuals, when we are upright, we are utilizing vision. So if you take away vision, as you know, you close your eyes, you become a little bit more on high guard, because I don't know what's up and down. I have to rely on now my second system, sensory system, which is my feeling in my legs, my positional sense in my legs. Am I on a, on a slope surface? Am I on grass? Am I on concrete? That's the that sensory input that you need. The third system, that we need is our internal compass. It's our inner ear. It's our vestibular system. That's where this weird V word comes from. And this comes out of the vestibular rehab realm that I also uh, used to specialize in, in individuals that had more peripheral inner ear problems, not MS related, that became more specialized to MS, but it was that those individuals complained about dizziness and imbalance as well as fatigue. And they kept coming back and telling me, you know, my, you know, I'm able to have less vertigo and dizziness. I'm able to balance better, but you know what? My fatigue is better. And I started putting two to two together. Thank goodness I can add. And now I brought it forward into the patients with MS because, as you know, and we're going to hear obviously about a lot more about fatigue. You know it's one of the primary complaints that you have. So then I really apologize. I you know, know that I should know that when you get handouts and they're printed out, this is going to be like microscopic. So I really apologize, but um, it's such a large conceptual model uh, that I build my investigation off and my clinical work off of. So I'll try to walk you through it, even though you can't really even see it. So there are a whole bunch of circles on your page. So these are the three systems I talked about. Vision, sensation, in our limbs and our trunk, and the inner ear of the vestibular system. In vestibular rehab, in my program that I designed, is that we alter these systems. We make it more challenging 
so that when you integrate that into the brain, brainstem and the brain itself, it becomes more of an integration of those systems and it's conditioning. So we've all heard of probably Pavlov, Pavlov is Pavlov's dog, in conditioning, you give reward or you give stimulus for some action. This is the same type of concept. If we take away your vision, we are also now having to integrate our sensation through our legs a bit more and whatever we have available for our inner ear. And if I have you stand on a certain surface that's very compliant, you have your vision, you're going to use your vision a lot more. And if I have you close your eyes on that surface, hopefully you're going to use your inner ear. So that is that whole piecemeal. We take away, we give, we stimulate, so that we can try to have what um, kind of a key term here is plasticity. The brain is able to work around some of your limitations within the brain and the central nervous system. This is a way for balance training that we can affect and improve is that we can maybe work around or work with what faculties you do have to improve. And that's that plastic nature of the brain. And the effects of that will kick up primarily as an improvement in your balance. So that's the primary component. Let's improve your ability to be upright, to be able to hopefully multitask as well, dual task, so that fatigue, whoops, so the overall effect on fatigue can be improved. And another area is that if there is presence of dizziness and vertigo coming into the program, we can hopefully improve that as well with the integration improvements in the conditioning and plasticity in the brain. So that by improving balance, dizziness and vertigo, this was my aim, main aim, which has never been looked at before. It was quite effective in this approach. So this was the study that we did a couple years ago. 